It's great to welcome you here today to the last distinguished lecture of the year in computer science and engineering. And it's a real pleasure to introduce Mary Jane Irwin. She's someone I've known for many years. She's been a leading light in computer architecture for uh, decades. She and I got out of graduate school at the same time, so I'm afraid we're the same age. <laughs> anyway, uh, she's been a faculty member at Penn State for a very long period of time, and uh, we're thrilled to have her uh, with us today. So without further ado, Mary Jane Irwin, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about adventures in scaling the multi-core memory wall. So you'll see various pictures like that, and I'll try to explain how they tie with the talk as I work my way through. So the forces at work that we need to think about is that technology is continuing to scale. Moore's law still holding. So if we look at where we are in 2012, right, we're at the 22 nanometer node. We're starting to see uh, fab lines running at 22 nanometers giving us about 32 billion transistors uh, capacity on a package, on a single chip. Uh, and of course, by 2014, hopefully we'll go to 16 nanometer nodes and double the number of transistors, et cetera. We'll see how long Moore's law continues to hold. It, there's been gloom and doom numerous times in the past, but it, it has continued. So if it makes it to eight, that'll be very interesting what we're going to do with 256 billion transistors. But um, about 10 years ago, maybe a little less, uh, we ran into the power wall. And if we look at this formula, this is for dynamic power. This is the power consumed by the switching transistors. It's determined by the capacitive load, that is how big these transistors are and how big the wires are connecting them to the neighboring transistors, times the supply voltage squared. Uh, notice that that's the quadratic term, so that's the term that we have the biggest knob to turn, times the clock frequency. So if we turn the supply voltage down, we can save on power, but the transistors run so or slower, so we have to also slow down the clock frequency. Of course, that also helps with power, but it doesn't help with performance. So if we look at a family of uh, Intel architecture, generation of Intel architectures from 82 to 2007, and look at their power consumption in watts for the package, you see this sort of curve. Uh, now there's a red line at uh, 100 watts because that's the typical limit that is used for power that can be consumed by the part to package it in a commodity package. Above 100 watts, it starts to be very expensive to package because you have to do special things. So the manufacturers have tried to keep, keep power consumption under 100 watts. Notice what happened here in 2001, 2004. We crossed that threshold, and it's come back down. And the reason it's come back down is that we've turned that quadratic term, the supply voltage, which has also turned the clock frequency down. So we don't see the clock frequency rates continuing to go up like we did for so long. They, uh, you know, two, 2 gigahertz, 4 gigahertz, and they've actually flattened, if not come down slightly. So we've got all these transistors, and we'd still like to keep on the performance curve. Right? We'd still like to keep performance going up. What are we going to do with all of those transistors to deliver performance if we can't continue to crank the clock up like we did for so many years? And of course, the answer has been, we're going to put multiple cores on the chip, and we're going to leave it to the programmers and to the operating system to make sure they're all cranking full speed ahead to get this doubling performance. And then next year, I'll put twice as many cores on there, once again, all cranking full speed ahead to get the doubling of performance. So a key core challenge, and I put multi in parentheses, because this has been a key challenge in computer architecture for a, a number of years, uh, was first coined by uh, Bill Wolf and Sally McKee in a paper they published in Computer Architecture News in 1994 called The Memory Wall. And so this equation says that the, time, the average time to do a computation uh, or to, to access information, right, to do a computation, is determined by the probability we're going to find that information in the cache times the time to access it out of the cache, plus the, the remaining probability, one minus the probability we find it in the cache, that is we have to go out to main memory, times the time it takes to get it out of main memory. And at least when I was starting my research, those two times, that is cache time and memory time, were about equal. Well, that's far from the case now. Right? 
uh, the memory time can be 100, 200, 300 times slower than the time to get information out of the cache. So we know that we really want to do the best job keeping information in the cache that we need to access. So the impact on performance of the growing disparity of the speed of the processor in the main memory is the memory wall that architects have run up against. And so we've been working for a number of years looking at the design of on-chip caches, which is the last line of defense before hitting the memory wall. And we're going to look at that in the context of multi-cores. So first I have to explain a little bit of notation. So here's a, a Harper Town. It's got four cores. Each of the cores has a private level one cache, actually two level one caches, instruction split instruction and data caches. And then two cores share an L2 cache, um, so we have two L2 caches on the chip. So the notation I'm going to use, because you might imagine once we go to three cores and more, once we go to, I'm sorry, to three levels of cache and more cores, there are going to be many more possibilities for this cache architecture. So we're going to call, this is a 2-2 two -two topology, so it's a y YZ topology. Since the level one caches are always private, there's no entry for the level one caches. Every core has a level one cache. The first term, the Y term, tells us how many of the next level, in this case level two caches, are shared by, the, by how many cores. So Y cores, this one is shared by two cores. And the last entry, because this is only a two-level cache, tells us how many level two caches there are. So this is a two-level two caches, each of them pair shared by two cores. So we can do the multiplication to tell us how many cores there are in the system. And then there's a memory controller to get off chip. So this is the socket or the chip. All of that is sitting on the same integrated circuit. Um, you might notice that, of course, uh, core zero and core one have to, have to uh, uh, negotiate use of that bus to get to the level two cache, and similarly for core two and core three. But I'm going to abstract the picture to look like this because it's easier to draw and there aren't as many lines to have to worry about. And we're going to throw away the memory controller, not because it's not important, it is, but because it's not part of today's talk. So there's the no notation. Okay. So we have this uh, configuration. We have many possibilities, and so this shows a different possibility than the one we just looked at. Uh, think about it. So what's the notation for this? Let's see. It has four level two cores, each of them private. So this is a one four right, configuration. And if we think about running an application on this, if we have four different applications, so we have four threads, they're different colors, so they're not related, right? They each have their own private space to work in and there's no contention. So it's really good for multi-programmed uh, workloads, so big server environments that tend to have lots of multi-programmed workloads. Right? On the other hand, if we're running one four-threaded app, right, it's not so good because it's very likely that these threads, because it's from one application, would like to share data. Right? And, it, and it also hurts with capacity in a way we'll, just, we'll see in just a minute. So if we have a different, the different configuration, the one we just looked at, the 2-2 configuration, right, and we're running, once again, four threads from the same app, right, this is good because they can share data and they can share capacity. So I only have to have uh, one copy of data A in level two if it's needed by both core zero and core one where in this case, I would have to have it in two locations, in two level two caches. So it helps increase my capacity, and it also provides for sharing data. So it's good for multi-threaded workloads. On the other hand, if we look at the flip side, where we have a, a, a multi-processor uh, configuration where we're running four threads, four different applications, single-threaded applications, we have to worry about thread, possible thread contention. If the red app and the orange app happen to map data to the same line in level two cache, then gonna, there's going to be contention. And we also have to, to uh, worry about the slower interconnect in that case. There are many more cache topologies. You're going to see mentions of them, but this is the last detailed slide I'm going to show uh, because we're going to talk about these in just a little bit for the compiler work. So Dunnington is on the left. It has six cores, one level three. 
The pair shared level two, so there are three of those six cores. And the halum on the right, which has a common level three and uh, private level twos. So there's the notation. Notice with this notation, we can represent all symmetric topologies. And I'll show you what an asymmetric topology is in a little bit. If we have completely shared four core machines, it's going to have one level two, one level three, and it's going to be a 411 configuration if we have level, three levels of cache. And we're not going to look beyond that, although th this notation certainly extends. If we have a completely private machine, then we have four level three caches and four level two caches, right? And that's the 114 configuration. Okay. All right. So that leads us in to the first topic. So this is static thread mapping and cache topology for a single multi-threaded application. This is work that appeared in PLDI uh, year before last. And so I'll explain why I picked this particular picture when I get to the end of this segment. But keep that in mind. So someone on a climbing wall. OK, so think about this. It's highly likely that code optimized for Nihalem I abbreviate because otherwise it takes too many, overfills the slide, won't run well on Harpertown or on Dunnington and vice versa. So what we did, and I'll tell you how we did it later, is to optimizing a code for Harpertown, running it on Harpertown, that's the one, right? And then taking that same code that's been optimized for Harpertown and running it on Nehalem and running, running it on Dunnington. And those are the results that we saw. Now, this shows you the configuration as a reminder, and what we really did was run it on two socket sets. So we're looking at running it on eight cores here, eight cores there, and 12 cores there. And of course, when we do the mapping from Dunnington back or from Harpertown to Dunnington, we expand it to 12 threads. So we're comparing apples to apples. OK. This is for one application, uh, for one multi-threaded application, but we saw similar results in other applications that we ran. So you see that. Uh, we're paying a performance hit by not using the code that's optimized for the architecture. If you look at Nehalem, you see similar. Of course, we run Nehalem on Nehalem, we get one. We suffer slowdown if we run it on the other architectures, and similarly for Dunnington. So just looking at one of them, right? Running code optimized for um, Harpertown on Nehalem incurs a 26% in perform performance hit. Those are, those are pretty reasonably large hits, right? When many architects look at 10% as a win, 26% performance penalty hurts. OK. So it's obvious that codes that are tailored, customized for a particular target system perform the best. So how can we do that? OK. So there are three things that we want to do when we're looking at tailoring these codes. We want to think about the thread to core mapping in two different spaces, one when there's no data sharing and one when there is data sharing. So, the one, so this one talks about no data sharing. So in the first case, the case on the right, on the left, sorry, uh, iteration I, which accesses A, and iteration J accesses B, I is on thread 0, J is on thread 2, I mean, sorry, core 2, I is on core 0, J is on core 2, right? Both are assigned to cores that do not share a level 2 cache, no conflicts, no issues, no problems. But if we look at the picture on the right, and I hit my animation key correctly, now we have I running on core 0, J running on core 1, and if they happen to map to the same cache block, we have problems because only A or B can be in level 2 cache at this, well, the, this level of cache at the same time. It can cause a a conflict because we force them to share a cache even though they're not sharing data. So if the rule that we're going to try to apply is if threads do not share data, we want to assign those iterations to cores that do not share caches if possible. If we have data sharing on the other hand, and we have the configuration set on the left where we really want to share B, Iterations I and J, which both access B, are mapped to cores that are not sharing a level 2 cache. We have a missed opportunity. First, we have to bring B into two locations. And second, we're um, burning capacity needlessly. Right? If we have the configuration on the right, it's much better for sharing of data. Right? Both I and J can share 
the copy of B in level two cache. We have constructive data sharing. We have improved L2 capacity. So the second rule we need to think about is if two shares threads do share data, we as want to assign those iterations to cores that do share caches. And there's one more thing to think about, and it's local thread scheduling. Once we've, done, once we've mapped the threads to particular cores, if we have a thread running on core zero that accesses A then B, and one on core one that accesses B then C, we can have a problem if uh, core one loads first, it loads in B, and both these, these pieces of data, once again, A and B map to the same cache block. Uh, so B comes in, right, and then core zero loads A, over, replaces B, and then it accesses B. It has to go back and get B a second time. So this is a missed opportunity. What we'd really like to do is, if we can, reschedule the code so that they both touch B in sequence so we can take advantage of the fact that B has been sitting in the cache and we have constructive data sharing. So when two threads do share data, reschedule the code if possible to exploit that reuse by the data still, that's still sitting in the cache. So what we did was look at a compiler solution that follows these three rules. Um, we developed a compiler that follows these three rules and exposed the cache topology to the compiler so that it could do thread to core mapping, assigning the threads to cores, and then did local iteration uh, rescheduling. And here's a schematic of showing the steps that the compiler goes through. We're exposing the cache topology uh, in the middle section. The set of tools that we used uh, was Microsoft's Phoenix compiler for doing code analysis. We developed the polyhedral framework iteration and data sets at Penn State, fed that to the Omega library, which came out with the iteration threads that we needed to pin to the course. So here's the flow. I'm going to show an example, which is more important than the flow. I thought about dropping this loop, so this slide, but left it in. First, we partition the loop iterations into iteration groups. We build a, an iteration graph. It's got the iteration groups as nodes. Those are the threads that are going to be assigned to the cores, and the edge is the degree of sharing between those nodes. We then start at the lowest level, or the highest level, whichever, level three of the cache, right? We cluster the iteration groups. We do load balancing and assign those to the next level, and we loop and do this again until we get down to level one where we're done. So here's an example. So here's an eight iteration group code. So you see there are eight circles in there with the, and those are the threads that are going to be mapped to the cores with the sharing amount shown on the interconnections between the iteration groups. And we're going to be looking at the 221 structure that's shown. Okay, so the first thing we do is we assign to level three. Well, everything gets assigned to a level three, right? Because there is only one level three. So we're done with the first iteration through the bottom loop of that previous slide. The next thing we do is look at the level two caches. Well, there's an obvious partitioning of these iteration groups for the level two caches. We grab the top set and assign it to uh, one of the level two caches and the bottom set to the, to the other level two cache. Notice we've done automatic load balancing because my example works perfectly for that. We've got four iteration groups assigned to level two and four assi assigned to the other level two. And then we go, so we finish level two, now we have to work on level one to figure out where these threads actually get mapped, which cores. And then we have to say, uh, now we look at this four iteration group that's been assigned to the left-hand level two. Well, we can split it to two. That's a nice load balancing structure. And we can do this sort of configuration or iteration assignment. Uh, there are others, but this is the most obvious one. And of course, similar configuration for the level one caches on the right. So there's our hierarchical clustering. We've tried to optimize data sharing where possible. Notice that the two, the two high-level circles that get assigned to level two don't have any data sharing, so they've been assigned to separate parts of the graph or the multi-core. So with the compiler in hand, what we did was set out to evaluate this. We had um, access to the two socket set uh, of the Harpertown, New Hallam, and Dunnington, so this is running on actual hardware that I'm going to show you. We also did some sensitivity analysis on CIMIX. Uh, we pulled a, as many benchmarks as we could find that were parallel benchmark sets, um, looked at a variety, they have a variety of data set sizes. 
We looked at a default data block size, which affects the size of the iteration groups of 2K bytes. Uh, we did a sensitivity analysis, is that the right size? And that's what these results are for. We were fairly happy with those, but we did look at a variety of sizes. And what I'm going to do is show you comparisons to base, which is the original application code, of course, parallelized, and base plus, which used uh, the state of the art data locality schemes, trying to do as many optimizations as possible that are known in the literature without doing the hierarchical mapping. And so here are the performance improvements. So this is for four different applications, running on Harpertown, running on Nehalem, and running on Dunnington, compared to base, which is a one, right, the red line up above, base plus, which is this optimized version, with, but without doing hierarchical mapping, and then topology aware. And there's a lot of bars to look at here. But you can see that lower is better, right? Because this is normalized execution time, so lower is better. And the yellow lines are significantly better, of course, than the base and better than um, the base plus scheme. And if we look at some percentages, for Harpertown, um, it was 28% better performance-wise over base and 16% over base plus. You can read the numbers down. So, 30% improvement in performance over just running the, the parallel application. Now, this is all due to the cache performance, because these are the same codes. It's just how the threads get assigned to the cores. So this is strictly due to the cache mapping. For Dunnington, uh, if you look at, hit, at misses in the cache, just at some interesting numbers, the cache misses were 18% for the level one caches, reduction in cache misses, 39% for level two, and almost 50% for level three. Those are pretty significant reductions, especially considering that level three is the slowest level of the cache. So that's, that's what we like to see. This is that cross-comparison performance degradation that uh, I showed on the motivation slide. Once again, this is running uh, Harpertown code, op code optimized for Harpertown on Nehalem and Dunnington, et cetera, right? For, once again, the four applications. Uh, and so anything above the line is degradation, and you notice everything is above the line, no surprise, right? And this shows how much worse it is running code optimized for one machine on a machine that it's not optimized for. So you can look at the numbers there. It's, it's, the exact numbers aren't important, but the fact that they're uh, in the uh, 19 to 20, what, to 31 percent are important, once again, as much as 30 percent. So now we're back to our picture, right? So here's the motivation for the picture. This is low risk, climbing walls are pretty low risk, right? Good returns, you get some exercise but limited applicability, right? And you're probably, not, after doing a climbing wall, you're probably not going to be ready to go out and free climb. And uh, limited applicability means this only works for fully parallel uh, loops, right? So it's not all applications they're going to run for. It's not even all parallel applications they're going to run for. But in that benchmark set that we looked at, 85% of the loops fit this category. So that's a pretty high percentage. It does. You do have to pay for it and increase comp compilation time, so if you're only going to run the code once, it's probably not worth it. Right. Uh, it didn't increase level one cache misses, which is some instruction misses, which is something we were worried about. And of course, as I said earlier, we looked at a variety of data block sizes, and you can make them smaller. It gives you smaller iteration groups, so you get better performance, but it costs you more in uh, compilation time. And we did a bunch of simulation experiments, which I won't repeat here. We looked at more cores. We looked at more levels of the cache. We looked at bigger caches, all the C. Uh, of course, for more levels in the cache, uh, it gave us even better performance because things get more complicated. It's more impact on performance. And we did a comparison to optimal uh, in the simulations and got a performance loss that less than 8% from the perfect configuration for that code. So now we're going to look at an entirely different system, right? And this is, I don't know if you saw the 60 Minutes coverage of um, Alex 
Hornoid climbing sentinel, but it scared me just to watch it on TV. And this is actually from both multi-programmed and multi-threaded, so I should update the title, right? And this is looking at just changing the cache topology dynamically during runtime. So I'm not going to do anything to the code. This works for all the code. So this has wider applicability, but it's pretty risky, right? Pretty risky because you have to change the architecture. So if you look at a 16 core system, so this is all simulation based. So if you look at running one 16 threaded application on 16 cores, and these are two of the applications we looked at a bunch of them. This one's, this is just two. And we compared the throughput normalized to a completely shared level two and level three. So that's 16 cores, one level two, one level three. And we looked at four different cache configurations. So you can read them across the top. So the blue one is totally private, right? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it is totally private. There are 16 level threes each individually used by level twos, right? Um, and 441 is the next one. You can think about how these configurations are, right? Um, then what you see is that the best structure for dead up is different than the one for Freakline. So the application wants a different topology, wants its own type of topology. One cache topology does not fit all applications. Okay, so that's the first walk away point. The second one is that the best topology varies. So this looks at a set of experiments we ran, uh, run, we got by running 16 single threaded applications on 16 different cores for the same uh, cache configurations, once again, normalized to completely shared level two and level three. This is looking at execution progress in 10 to the eight cycles through, through the execution, okay. So there is the best cache topology uh, for the 1116 structure. I don't know, hopefully you can see the yellow line. I can see it up here. Yellow doesn't always show well. There it is for 441, et cetera. And so what you notice from this is, depending on the point in time, I want any, all of those cache topologies. Right? It depends on the point in time in execution. So the best cache topology varies with time. Okay, that's the motivation for a dynamic cache topology. So we came up with an architecture that we call morph cache for, for doing just that. So this is looking at just a four core system. So what we like to be able to do is pair share the level threes, right? Pair share the level twos. Et cetera. You can continue, and we'll look at all common. Whoop, there's one more. Pair share the pair shared level threes, depending on what the application wants at that point in time. Notice that you can morph this into asymmetric configurations. This is a configuration that we can't represent with our notation, and it's one that you wouldn't see in, in a multi core these days, right? So these are private level twos on the left and a pair shared level two on the right. Very different structure. And it turned out asymmetric configurations were often the best for uh, running application. We limited the number of merge and split possibilities just to contain the hardware complexity, and I'll give you a little sketch as to what the hardware we're going to require. We only are doing pair sharing. So we won't, don't group three, we don't group five, we only group pairs, and pairs of pairs, and pairs of pairs of pairs, et cetera. So the first thing we need is a policy to decide when we want to do the merge and the split. Okay. And so what you really want to know is what's active in that cache at this point in time. And cache utilization is not a good prediction metric because cache utilization, presence in the cache, doesn't indicate active data reuse. We want to know about active data reuse. So what we're going to do is come up with a way of measuring the ACF, the active cache footprint of a thread, as a set of unique cache lines referenced by that thread in an epoch. That's its footprint. Right. And we notice that the best cache topology can measure with the ACF of different threads at a given level of the cache, the ACF of, 
of uh, one thread at different levels in the cache, in its own particular cache, and variations of data sharing among different threads. So now the question is, how do we estimate that at runtime with low cost, low hardware cost? Because we're going to do this in hardware. And so what we do is define the ACF bit vectors. So these are ACFVs, one per cache in each of level two and level three. And then the question is, how do you get information into that? Well, when we get an access to level two, we take the tag, the address, we run a hash, hardware hash function to go into that bid vector, right? Uh, actually, when we bring a piece of information into the cache, we hash into that bit vector, set the bit to one. What we have thrown out, we set its bit vector to zero. So this is a measure of what's active in the cache, right, by its address. And we have two to, in, two to the n bits in each bit vector. Okay. So the properties of ACFV are that the number of ones in the ACFV, which we abbreviate with ACFV bars, is representative of the active utilization of the cache slice. The number of common ones between a pair of ACFVs tells us the degree of sharing between the two neighboring caches. And we have to reset those ACFVs every so often so that we're capturing actively used cache lines. So they get re reset every epoch. And I'll tell you how long the epoch is. So how many bits do we need in this bit vector, in these, these bit vectors, because there's more than one? So what we did was we looked at two hardware hashing functions, XOR and Modulo compared to the coefficient of correlation with an oracle ACF estimator, where there are as many bits in the bit vector as there are lines in the cache. Right, that tells us down here what the baseline is. And you can see that we get pretty close to one fairly quickly, that we have a correlation coefficient of um, 94%, or 0.94, sorry, for 64 bits and 0.96 for 128 bits. So 64 bits is not such a huge uh, ACFV. Okay, so now we have a mechanism for determining where the active, how, what, what the active information is in the cache, how much there is, and what addresses it corresponds to, approximately. And so now we can come up with rules for merging. So the conditions for, doing favor, uh, for favoring merging is that we want to do capacity sharing. So if the neighboring cache slices have complementary ACF fees, one is highly utilized, its neighbor is underutilized, that makes sense to do capacity sharing. If the neighboring cache slices ACF fees have a lot of ones in common, that says there's a high degree of data sharing. I'm use, assuming all of these are using the same, sharing the same address space, all of these applications. So. That shows a high degree of data sharing. Once again, that would favor merging these cache slices. So we don't have two copies. You should be asking yourself all sorts of questions at this point about how can we fix this? How can we fix that? I'm coming to it. So what we did was we did a lot of experiment with, experiments with trying to come up with a merge split aggressiveness threshold, right? And determine the high-low, that is for the ACFV on the left and the one on the right, right? And um, we experimentally determined that if one is at 60% and one is at 30% utilization, that that's a good threshold for merging these two cache slices into a pair shared slice. It's pretty easy to merge. What you do is if it's eight-way associativity, it becomes a 16-way associativity. These are just slices. And the merging is really through the interconnect right? and doubling of the associativity. So there's no hardware modification we have to make to the actual cache slices. OK, so these are the issues you should be asking yourself. So we, we've assumed all inclusive caches, not exclusive caches. So we have a rule that if we're going to merge L2 slices, we can do it only when the L3 slices below it are also merged. Otherwise, we have the problem with an L2 slice that's bigger than an L3 slice, and we can no longer do inclusion. Right? So we have that rule we have to follow. You should be saying to yourself, I should, I, I've already given the answer, but two, if, wait, wait, if you have two cache slices, 
that have the same data in them because the threads above them are using that same data and you merge them into one cache slice. Now you have two copies of the data. You have a consistency issue, right? Well, yeah. So we had to fix that. The first possibility we looked at is when we did this merging, just flush one of the caches. Performance hit big time, but it fixes it. The other thing we did was, well, actually we looked at a number of schemes. There's some interesting schemes here. But what we finally ended up doing was lazy invalid, what we call lazy invalidation, which is we invalidate the duplicate data on access to that data when we come out with multiple hits. So when we come out with multiple hits, what we do is we invalidate one and, and we run with the other one. So that's a way to do lazy invalidation. It doesn't affect performance. You have to worry about maintaining LRU information. We came up with a way to fix that. And although we maintain the ACFVs uh, separately for each slice, we still keep that per slice. When we look at merged ones, we just concatenate the ACFVs to think about, um, well, are we going to pair share this pair and that pair and end up with four slices together? We also have to come up with rules for splitting cache slices, right? Uh, we split merge cache slices when the ACFVs change significantly and merging is no longer justified, right? So we know why merging is justified when we have this 60% used, only 30% used merge, or they've got a lot of ones in common. And I haven't defined what we measured as a lot, so, but it's there. Okay. We also have to worry about inclusion, once again. Uh, we've got to work the other direction. We can split at level three cache slices only if level two cache slices have already been in split, bid split because we have this inclusion property. And we can have possibilities where we could either split or merge. So in this case, we have two possibilities. So if we've got a pair that both have high utilization and another pair that have low utilization, and these don't have a lot of ones in common, although that's not obvious from the picture, but we're going to assume that. We could do the following, right? This is no longer high-low, which was the reason we use for justifying, and it is no longer a lot of ones in common, so that would argue to split that one, and we could leave this pair together. So that's one choice. The other choice is just to put everything together, because we've got high, high, low, low, right? That sounds reasonable. We could do that, and what we did was use the scheme that was uh, merge aggressive rather than split aggressive, so that's the approach we use. Turns out it really depends on which level cache you're working at as to which is the optimum. An interesting point, which I, I was going to read to you, but I decided to put it in as a pop-up, is that it turned out that 39% of the multi-program configurations and 54% of the multi-threaded merge uh, configurations, merge split configurations, resulted in asymmetric configurations. I think those are pretty interesting numbers. So that says that the ideal cache configuration for these applications is really an asymmetric configuration, not something you'd ever find at this point in a commercial part. Okay, so it doesn't come for free. There's high risk, right? You've got to redesign the hardware. You don't have to do much with the caches. They're really pretty natural. But you do have to redesign the interconnect structure to get to the caches. So that was our next task, was to figure out how to do that, although we had a good idea of how we were going to do this before we even started. And we, what we did was came up with segmented bus interconnect. The buses are composed of components and switches. We have to build an arbiter tree, right? So for example, if you turn off switch 2 and switch 5, you can end up with a configuration like this. It's an asymmetric one, a four shared, a two shared, a two shared, where you have the bus connections, right? And you've got the arbiters to get to them. Um, this one I know you can't see even in the front, much less in the back, but it's to show you that we did look at a layout of a particular size for a 16 core system. We designed the arbiter logic and bus logic in Verilog, ran it through the Synopsys design compiler, captured the interconnect links to figure out how long it was going to take to go through four levels of arbiters, which is what we need for a 16-core system, with the interconnect maximum across the chip, so we could get a timing on this. And that gave us the timing for figured out, figuring out how much it was going to cost us to get to these merge caches, because we want to make sure we're counting all that overhead. 
So if it's not merged, it takes 10 cycles for a level 2 cache or 25 cycles for a merge cache. And in a level 3 cache, the simulations that we use was 30 for local and 45. That's very conservative numbers. We know ways to speed up the merge design, but we didn't use that in experiments. The epic interval is 300 million cycles. That's how often we reset the ACFVs. Okay, workloads. Another eye chart. This is just to show you. We looked at lots of workloads. What we tried to do was look at a mix of workloads. So what we did was we measured the ACFVs of the different benchmarks, and we tried to look at a combination of benchmarks that had low ACFVs and high left ACFVs and a combination of ACFVs so we could see how that was going to impact things. So that's what this is. Parsec, we looked at 16 threads, sim large input. Okay, I've got two result slides here, one for multi-program results, one for uh, multi-threaded results. So what this shows you is, once again, throughput normalized to the same cache shared level 2 and level 3 cache we've been looking at, the same four caches we looked at before, and more cache, right? The red line is at 1, right? So anything above 1 is good because this is throughput, right? Improvement. And you can see that the black line is the best in all cases, right? There's some where it's not as good as we had hoped. If you go back and look at those benchmarks, if you could see them, which I know you can't, those turn out to be ones where there were high ACFVs in level two and level three. So there was lots of act cross activity. Right? Um, so there are improvements, once again, 30% down to 19%. Uh, Pretty good improvement. Multi-threaded results are not quite as impressive, right, uh, for the Parsec applications. Once again, higher is better, although it's better in almost all cases, right? The ones where it worked the best, right, uh, are highlighted there, right, where, I, where there was lots of data sharing. Lots of the high, these are the ones that have high ACF fees. Okay, and once again, performance numbers. You can read them if you want. Okay, so it's high risk, it's good return, it's broad applicability, which I think applies to free climbing, pretty high risk. High risk because you have to redesign the architecture, at least the bus interconnect. Uh, observations, as I've told you already, is that asymmetric topologies often deliver the best returns. There's a question about scalability beyond 16 cores because it's bus interconnect. Yes, it doesn't scale to 1,024 cores. We d ran a bunch of sensitivity experiments, once again, using uh, on the simulation. We looked at fewer and more caches, bigger caches. We didn't look at more cache levels. One thing we didn't look at that I think is promising is to use the ACFE information to decide on bank power down, slice power down, I should call it. If it has a low utilization, just merge it and power down the one slice. Merge it as far as the bus interconnect, power down the one slice, so that all, uh, both of these cores are using only one slice uh, of the cache. Save energy. Okay, one last quick one is looking at dynamic thread mapping. Uh, what you should notice is that this guy is free climbing, but he has a rope, <laughs> right? He's not free free climbing. He's got some protection there, so it's not as high a risk, thank goodness. And this is uh, results from a paper that's going to be presented at VEE next week. This is a project that's done uh, with folks at the University of Virginia and the University of Pittsburgh. So if you look at a static cache topology in a real system, you probably have a variety of applications. You have some multi-threaded applications, you have some single-threaded applications. But you also have to think about the following. What happens if core three starts to heat up? Well, your operating system should jump in to the rescue, right? Whoops, I need to animate. Pick up that purple thread, move it over to core two, put, put core three to sleep, which should then allow it to cool down. The flame should stop, but I don't think I've got that animation perfect, right? Allow core three to recover so we can use it again. So having a runtime system to help with this is great. And there are people that have looked at this, in particular in the cache space. Um, the project we've been working on we call REACT, and this is the paper that's 
being presented at VEE next week, working with uh, Mary Lou Sofa and Jack Davidson and Bruce Childer, and then a couple of us at Penn State. So quickly, just to show you the React core, there are wrap application wrappers. So there's a general, there's a global execution manager which monitors everything, and there's a local execution manager per core. Uh, when an application comes along and starts up, it says, I have a thread I want to run, please give me a core, goes to the gym and asks for a core. If the gym has a free core, it gives it to it. The limb assigns the thread to that core and it's off and running, et cetera. Thread creation, you can imagine the cred, thread, when threads die, the, uh, the limb looks at that core and says, well, I don't have a thread to run on that core anymore. I'm going to give it back to the gym. If it happens to have come in last, because this is first come, first serve, so application three, if you can see from the back, there are a couple of cores that have two threads assigned to it. So um, because the gym ran out of cores, and uh, if one of the threads stops, then we can, the limb can reallocate threads across the space that it has. This shows you the components. I'm not going to go into it in detail. The important thing is there's a communication structure. There's software actuators, that is, reassign threads to a, move threads from one core to another. There are hardware actuators, that is, you can turn off prefetchers, you can change clock speeds. Um, and then there are monitors. We monitor the hardware status through the, through the hardware performance monitors. We can monitor thread status. We know when threads are created and when they're died and when they're suspended. And we can monitor system utilization, how, how much utilization on each of the cores. So just to show you one example, and then I'll wrap up here. Um, so this is for Parsec applications, showing you the characteristics. What we did was we compared, so the baseline here is at zero, to Linux, the Linux mapping. So Linux does the same thing. Uh, but we did a static isolation mapping. We mapped app one uh, on core zero and core one, and app two on core two and core three. So this is app zero and app one defined over here. So you notice for the first two, no problem. But for the last two, mm, not so good compared to Linux mapping. What's happening here is that Keneal uh, starts up with only one thread, and we've assigned it two cores. So there's one core sitting idle and the Linux thread mapper does a much better job than we did, because it recognizes that. Uh, this one, um, uh, body track, which is one of the applications that's running is I.O. bound, so it's, it's suspended for long periods of time. Once again, Linux was smart enough to figure out that that was happening and to assign that core to a, another thread, or take another thread and move it to that core. So once we applied React to the system, and did dynamic mapping with uh, load balancing and looking at utilization, we got significant improvement over the Linux mapper. Okay, so this is a medium risk, good returns, broad applicability. We need two things. We have to be able to look at the performance monitors, right? Read the hardware performance counters, and we have to be able to pin threads to cores. All of the modern multi-cores that I know of provide those two features. It has to be low overhead. Overhead is a killer in this. For the React system, for a 16-core system, for eight threads per application, and uh, reading the performance counters every 10 milliseconds, it was under 3%. So I think that's acceptably low overhead. The nice thing about it is there are lots of other policy that you can look at. Uh, one of them that we've started calling fighting the broken screw is for reacting to those thermal emergencies that I showed in the first plot. The name comes from, about, uh, from the fact that Virginia had a machine that one, core, one particular core in a corner of the, of the socket seemed to be overheating often, and it turned out when they looked at the heat sink, the screw on the heat sink was broken in that corner, so <laughs> it was, it was uh, overheating. And so React was able to do a much better job almost 10% of moving the thread before the thermal emergency occurred uh, by monitoring the temperature. Uh, we also looked at, we looked at a, a bunch of policies, but de disabling memory prefetchers to reduce energy, not only did that help with energy, 12%, but it helped with performance uh, because there was less contention for the access, uh, for the access off chip to the main memory. So, in closing, 
optimizing non-trip cache topology, our last line of defense before uh, hitting the memory wall will require the co cooperation, I believe, of the architecture, the compiler, and the runtime system. We want to put all three of these together. I think about putting all three of these together. There are many other multi-core challenges. We've run out of time. So I want to thank my colleagues first and a whole host of students in the MDL group, although certainly not all of them worked on this project. I think Shekhar, who was one of the lead students, is in this picture somewhere. And I will be happy to take questions. Okay, that was a few minutes over, but not much. Luis. Yes, so this was a great talk. Thank you. So I was uh, wondering whether you know, optimizing the memory hierarchy, making it richer, more complex, is the right thing to do, given that we can't really power all transistors at the same time. I mean, Moore's Law is giving us all of these transistors, right? Memory hierarchies normally use a lot of transistors because they're really large. You know, uh, transistor arrays, and uh, but we can't leave them on because we don't have enough power. Even though, so well, I guess the, memory, that so the, the question is: is the memory right is very low activity. activity? Memory, the memory, the caches, they're low activity. There are lots of transistors, so you have to figure out how to control the static power consumption. There are ways to do that. Well, no, but I mean, so to keep to make them useful, they have to hold their state. Otherwise, you're going to be losing the state. Yeah, but there's off. some minimal voltage that you could set them out to hold their state. So. There are people working that, but that's one of the things I talked about, that shutting down banks is uh, something that, that we do want to look at with these ACF fees, because I think shutting down, un if, you do, if you do pair sharing and you've got this segmented bus structure and you've got a low utilized bank, shutting that bank entirely down so there's no leakage power consumed at all is a reasonable approach. You have to keep the ACF fees running, but they're fairly short depending on how much energy the hashing function uses. So do you have another alternative? Well, um, leaving them off. <laughs> uh, I, I was just wondering whether it would be uh, wiser to find ways of you know, moving data less often. Absolutely. Right, I mean, so because it could be data, and it's essentially like, you might want to optimize for data movement and not for... Uh, I agree. Use, yeah. I agree. I think there's lots of, I should have put application in this space too. I think there's lots of space there. I'm supposed to repeat the question, which I forgot to do. So it seems like in the multi-threaded case, there's advantages to asymmetric cache hierarchies um, beyond the data sharing you're trying to exploit here. Um, my application performance might be limited by the one thread that simply has a bigger working set. Are there techniques you can use to, to try, you know, to just, just steal some other course cache and the application wins overall? That, yeah, that so, so the, he was talking about the asymmetric cache sharing and that maybe in addition to the advantages I've shown here, there's an advantage that um, there might be a thread running on the core that's got this asymmetric structure that just has a bigger working set. And um, yeah, I think there's a possibility. We haven't looked at it, but um, because all of these had very, well, they had similar working set sizes. They had different sort of caching behavior as far as well, how well behaved they were. There's some interesting papers that look at a number of these applications. Uh, Gabe Lowe, who I, I is close here, was looked at one and you know he classified them as rabbits and devils. It's very interesting, but it's a way of talking about how well behaved applications are, is how they use caches. And some applications are not well behaved at all. They, they end up going off the chip almost all the time because they're streaming applications, so they don't cache. And we had a few of those in this set. Other questions? Okay, thank you, you very much. Thank you.